It was once thought by people whose lives were comfortable and untroubled that the long arc of the human species bent towards progress, that through humanity's science and technology, war, pestilence, death, famine, the four great sagittars of myth, would be defeated and the human epoch ushered in. With everything becoming better, more convenient, safer, and more secure for them, these people believed in their naivety that such terrors of the past would ultimately come to rest there. Things would be forgotten, or, at best, learned about in museums and archives, where they, safe in their comforts, could scoff at how we were ever so foolish to let such things trouble us. We even thought that such progress would rid humanity of its baser instincts. Fear and greed, and all that fear and greed leads to. Bigotry, tyranny, and cruelty, seemingly for the sake of nothing else but the validation of one's own self-worth. These fools, blinded by their obsession with the myths they had been taught to believe were truths, even felt that logic, reason, and debate would banish all evils, too married to such patently false ideals to realize that humans are emotional creatures forever chasing the whims of brains barely biologically evolved to handle their own sentience. Our history, as seen from the present time, has put paid to all that, as we have forgotten the promise of progress, only to succumb to the horrors of corruption, brutality, and entropic authority. We are told we are divinely led, and led we are, to the edge of the apocalypse. Perched are we upon the edge of oblivion, screaming our last into the uncaring void and into the faces of thirsting horrors. It did not have to be this way. Nothing had to have been as it is. There was once a time when we aspired to be more, to be greater than what we were then, and far, far greater than we are now. It was failure, and a failure so total it damned us all to a slow, painful death, a seemingly inevitable decay into nothingness. Our opportunities were squandered, by whim and chance perhaps, but also by vanity in place of humility, arrogance in place of modesty, and certainty in place of questioning. It was, in many ways, the emotion of man, that indelible part of ourselves we have never and likely will never be free of, that damned us. Yet all the worse was it for it was done by those who believed themselves to have been its masters, those who believed that through their reason and logic they had conquered their all-too-human selves, and that by their theoretical modeling of the world they knew more of it than those whose warnings were informed by dreadful and very real experience. Know then that this is a record of the great conclave, and the decision that would shape the fate of our species forevermore. The Council of Nikea. Formerly, the Council of Nikea was a court ordained at the highest levels of the Magisterium Imperialis, presided over by the Emperor of Mankind himself for the stated purpose of resolving the Librarius question. That is, should the use of human psychers be permitted within the Legiones Astartes. In reality, Nikea was very much more than that. To many, yes, it was the final resolution of the issue Astartes psychers posed, and indeed many were highly in favor of the continued recruitment, cultivation, and training of said, seeing the Council as a marvelous opportunity for human advancement. To others, it was an ideological and academic congress whose resolution, however impactful in actuality, 
was nevertheless a largely theoretical conclusion to a worthwhile experiment. Yet others considered it to be a military summit, the purpose of whom was to dictate the future of human warfare. And, to yet others still, it was to be a trial, and a trial of one man. Magnus the Red, called the Crimson King, Lord of the planet Prospero, and Primarch Master of the 15th Legion Astartes, the Thousand Sons. Doubtlessly, many who came to Nikea came with genuine intentions under the auspices of human unity, striving to add their considerable voices to what they no doubt felt was one of the most paramount concerns of the age. Yet it is undeniable that others did so with less virtuous aims, arriving at the world with vendettas decades old and the hope of vengeance kindling in their bellies. To these, the blood of the Cyclopean Primarch was in the water, and they had but to make their move. It was, as is no doubt clear, not only a phenomenally charged event in all manner of ways, but one whose purpose depended entirely upon where one fell in one's response to the Psyche question, or indeed, one's opinions of Magnus the Red. How then did such a summit come to be, and why indeed was its subject matter of such great and terrible import? The answer, or at least a fundamental part of it, lies in the depths of the past, in the hideous epoch known, by a name one has always found to be quite an understatement, as the Age of Strife. Beginning at the end of the machine wars of the 25th millennium, and lasting, nominally, until the conclusion of the unification wars in the early 30th millennium, humanity fell, and fell like we had never fallen before. Crippled by rampant AI armies, Xenos incursions, and intraspecies conflicts on a galactic scale, the human race was ill-prepared to cope with the sudden arrival, in literally unprecedented numbers, of the newest and possibly next form of the human genome, the Psyker. Upon every world humanity had set foot upon, human Psykers were emerging, capable of harnessing the incredible power of the Immaterium, that nether dimension of pure emotional energy existing on the other side of the skein of reality. A small number of Psykers found themselves, at the time of the emergence of their abilities, with a certain degree of control over them, and enough talent or willpower, or both, to hone them further. The vast majority, however, were not so lucky, rapidly losing all semblance of control and succumbing to violent insanity, or worse, possession by the entities that dwell within the Immaterium. To the creatures of the warp, every human is a flickering light in their deep, dark ocean, but the human psyker is akin to a blazing fire. They are drawn to them, these predatory idea forms, ever seeking to break through the veil that separates reality and unreality, to sup upon mortal emotions that make up their diet. Psykers had begun to emerge on human worlds for millennia before the fall of the species. Upon many, they had been met with intense curiosity and study, whereas on others, they met only with superstition and death. It is a dreadful irony that those bigoted, hateful worlds were ones that were best prepared for the oncoming Age of Terrors. The long peace of the Age of Technology gave way to the carnage and slaughter of the machine wars, and, with the warp in turmoil and its denizens ever more alive and hungry, the sudden emergence of a glut of human psychers proved catastrophic beyond imagination. On millions of human worlds, psychers fell victim to their own powers, creatures from a plane worse than all the hells of human fancy, pupating within their flesh and emerging in gory apotheosis to slaughter and maim. Whole planets were consumed by these incursions, and elsewhere, the tides of the Empyrean merely corrupted instead of possessing, mad psyker despots rampaged through the fires of their once great civilizations, ruling, ruining, or ravaging. 
This era would last for 5,000 years, an age of death and destruction never before seen, and above it all, the specter of the insane human psychic, crackling with barely contained eldritch energies, eyes alight with a seemingly unstoppable malignancy. The emergence of the Imperium as a regime came in tandem with an outright refutation of the uncontrolled and unrestricted use of psychers that had defined the Age of Strife. The worst of the foes that the early Unity regime had faced upon the surface of Terra had been sorcerer warlords mad with unchecked mutations or in possession of arcane and corruptive lore from the darkest reaches of history. While the Emperor himself was indeed a psyker, his strength in that art, and his willpower besides, were so inordinately separated from the human scale as to render him immune to the corruption those weaker of us perennially faced. When the Imperium had been formally founded, bodies within it had been formally incepted, specifically to account for and deal with the Psyker. The Divisio Telepathica's existence was not merely born of the necessity for efficient interstellar communication in the form of its astrotelepaths, no, but to regulate the entire sum of humanity's psychic human resources. Psychers rendered unto the Divisio found their lives committed to draconian study and training, brutally hammering their abilities into forms useful to the Imperium. Moreover, they were limited and controlled strictly. The distrust of the Imperium for the Psychic is one born of millennia of pain and trauma, but additionally one of utmost necessity. Humanity had not been changed by the hand of the Age of Strife, it had only been traumatized by it. The human genome was not fundamentally different in M30 than it had been in M25, so the control of psychers was placed at the apex of Imperial doctrine. The astropaths, the navigators, the battle psychers, they were grim necessities of the Imperium in its Great Crusade. Resources wielded, yes, but rigidly controlled and structured, and bound by the strongest and most inviolate decrees of the Lex Imperialis. In many ways, the question of baseline human psychers had already been decided. They were destined for processing by the Telepathica, or should they be deemed too dangerous from the outset, or have the Teremity to resist the Lex, they would then become the prey of the Null Maidens of the Sisters of Silence, to their ultimate and untimely end. Where the question remained was in the context of the Legionnaires Astartes. As with all humanity, the Astartes possessed the genes of the Psyker, and, as this genome could not be readily identified with any degree of veracity, Psykers could and would emerge from within the Legions long, long after their initial ascension procedures, from mortal to transhuman. The danger of the Psyker remained, but its interaction with the biological genius that was the Astartes' form, as well as their indomitable willpower and terrifying martial skills, well, therein lay the rub. Many within the Imperium, scarred by their experiences or the experiences of their kin, spoke loudly of the looming catastrophe that this represented. The Legiones Astartes were a law unto only two bodies, their own Primarch, and the Emperor himself above that. Not for them was the severe oversight of the Scholastica Psychana, the battle psyker wing of the Divisio Telepathica, nor indeed any limitations that body placed upon its initiates. The freedom of the Primarchs, by dint of their role and lineage, permitted them total say over the functioning and structure of their legions, meaning ultimate authority with what must be done with any psychic Astartes lay to with them. Eighteen of the most singular and unique personalities in the history of humanity. There was, as one's acolytes may imagine, nothing even approaching a consensus. The most vocal amongst the Emperor's scions against the use of Astartes psychers, and indeed any psychers at all for that matter, was Mortarion, known as the Death Lord, the grim Primarch of the 14th Legion Death Guard. 
his experiences upon his homeworld of Barbarus, suffering greatly under the yoke of Psyker tyrants and their pernicious powers, before ultimately leading the liberation of his people from them, had left deep wounds upon his character and outlook, ones apparently inextricable from he himself, despite the role Psykers played within the Imperium he fought for. And indeed, it must be noted, his own gene sire's status as first amongst these Psykers. Forever Mortarian's mind was cast back to his time as a child prisoner of the Overlord of Barbarus, an existence alone in a rocky, corrupted bastion, with only the company of witch thralls and sorceress texts to relieve him of the pain inflicted by his tyrannical warden. To the Death Lord, the Psyker was a danger that could not be brooked under any circumstances, lest their corruptive influence ultimately come to dominate the minds of free and pure humanity. His opinions were, as noted, widely shared by a humanity only recently freed from the yoke of tyrants very similar to those whose lives Mortarian had claimed. Sorcery was the watchword, a term loaded with ancient meaning and far more recent suffering. To those of a superstitious bent, ill-taught in the realities of the universal system, all psychic activity is sorcery or magic, power seemingly conjured from the Aether through arcane means. In the era of the Imperium, with the Great Crusade spreading the Emperor's atheistic imperial truth to all worlds it conquered, it had become a commonly used term applied to unclean psychic powers, that is to say, the pursuit of unrestrained etheric abilities without any heed paid to the dangers involved, or to the wisdom, and more importantly control, the Emperor had placed upon them through the Divisio Telepathica. Sorcery, to those of Mortarians bent, was a sin of the past, a term redolent with fallen demagogues and genocidal aether things. It was the promise of the Age of Strife returned, and was to be abhorred as such. Two of the Death Lord's brothers formed a vocal triad with him against the use of Astarte Psykers. Lehman Russ of the Sixth Legion Space Wolves and Corvus Corax of the 19th Legion Raven Guard. While both their legions possessed Astartes with abilities beyond the scope of what can be considered normal, both had seen and fought against those who would wield psychic power unchecked, and both feared its usage in a body as vast, unmonitored, and ultimately as dangerous as a space marine legion. While these Primarchs and their baseline human supporters often spoke in terms they broadly applied to the entirety of the Legionis Astartes, they were not by any means unwilling to point directly at one in particular, one whose fate was rapidly becoming inextricably bound in the Librarius question, the 15th Legion Thousand Sons. The Scions of Prospero had been, largely by their own design, outsiders to their cousins in other legions for almost the entirety of the Great Crusade. They were formed, despite their numerical designation, in the final days of the Unification Wars, and were, due to gene seed issues, unable to take part in any of that period's climactic battles, or even in the subsequent solar reclamation, denying them both the operational experience in as diverse a blooding ground as Saul represented, and additionally the chance to fight alongside and forge bonds of brotherhood with their fellow legions. Initially, the seclusion allowed them to pass effectively unnoticed by both history and their cousins, but eventually the eyes of the Imperium would pass over this 15th legion, and voices would openly wonder why they remained so secretive, why their growth as a legion appeared slow, as if deliberately stymied, and why their recruitment practices were so specific. Eventually, rumors turned to reports, swirling ever about a legion that manifested strange abilities far beyond the Astartes' norm, until eventually the naked truth was common knowledge. The Thousand Sons did not just possess psychers within their ranks, they were a legion of them, the psychic potential of mankind fully wedded to Astartes' physiology. Should any within the Imperium have had concerns then and there, they would only grow with the Legion's reunification with its Primarch, Magnus the Red, under whose tutelage the Legion's psychic abilities and proclivities grew a thousandfold. 
The 15th wore its penchant for the occult and the arcane openly and brazenly. Their campaigns were won on the backs of their psychic talents, first and foremost, and they developed a well-earned reputation for being voracious consumers and hoarders of lore of all kinds, material oft prescribed, too, all of it spirited away by 15th Legion elements from conquered civilizations to be stored in their librariums upon Prospero. The Thousand Sons and Magnus proclaimed that they were only acting as the Emperor had made them to be, and that was it not in the interest of the Great Crusade and humanity as a whole that the past be studied along with the present, that knowledge should not be feared, but explored so that it may yet be understood. Their detractors bade that such practices could only lead to damnation, for was it not within these eldritch tomes of the past that humanity had learned all of its darkest secrets and wielded them? And was it not the wisdom of the Emperor and his imperial truth that had thrown back the shadows of old night, that it may never return? The debate, at first in the realm of theoretical academia, only intensified with every new victory the Thousand Sons added to their honor roll, accompanied as they always were with brazen displays of sorcerous powers and bullish moves to lay claim to all knowledge and records of the civilization conquered, human or Xenos. It would only worsen with the foundation of the Librarius Initiative. While no means the doing of Magnus alone, the Red Cyclops was nonetheless its most vocal component, a fact which, combined with the reputation of his 15th Legion, indelibly marked it as his. In truth, it was the creation of a threefold. Magnus, yes, but also his brothers Sanguinius of the 9th Legion Blood Angels and Jagatai Khan of the 5th Legion White Scars. Both Primarchs were ardent supporters of the use of psychic powers amongst the Legiones, with the former being psychically talented himself, and the latter a product of a world with millennia-old traditions of stable and well-trained tribal psychers. The Librarius was formed as an ad hoc template, primarily based upon the standards of the Blood Angels Legion, but incorporating elements, and more importantly, training procedures, from the White Scars and the Thousand Suns. The project had the support of the Emperor when initiated, and was indeed one of noble intent, a brotherly effort of outreach intended to aid fellow legions in allowing the natural gifts of their Astartes to be controlled, nurtured, and put to use upon the battlefield, where they would ultimately be turned towards the best possible use for humanity. It was met, perhaps predictably, with varied responses. Mortarion scorned its very existence, stating that he would rather die than accept the use of psychers within his legion, whose fates were largely unknown, but rumours persisted as to their untimely termination should they be unable to hide their powers. Others demurred, seeing psychers as unpredictable and dangerous. Perturabo, Iron Lord of the Fourth Legion, stated that such an initiative was ultimately not worth the effort and resources, believing them better spent elsewhere. Culture and organizational character also had an impact. Rogel Dorn of the Seventh Legion Imperial Fists, despite being renowned for his rivalry with his brother of the Fourth, was also opposed to their use, his legion having developed something of a reputation for being both staunch bearers of the Imperial truth and harsh punishers of those who would dabble in the arcane. Despite the critics, the Librarius Initiative did meet with success elsewhere. Fulgrim the Phoenician of the Third Legion Emperor's Children delighted in incorporating the wisdom of his brothers into his own forces, seeing the Librarians as another step upon the path to human perfection. Likewise so did Robut Gulliman of the Thirteenth Legion Ultramarines, accepting the Doctrina as an invaluable strategic tool in the repertoire of his vast legion, vocally supporting the continued existence of the program as a product of sound scholarship. Less vocal in their praise were Conrad Kurz of the Eighth Legion Night Lords and Alpharius of the Twentieth, but both were known to favor regulation that permitted psychic utilization. Kurz, by most accounts, was a far more powerful psyker than many realized, 
and had a higher than average proportion of his legion displaying emerging talents in that area. Of Alpharius's position, little concrete is known, beyond his tacit support, but the Alpha Legion were never ones to discard useful tools simply because they were denied its use by societal standards, and the truest scope of their use of psychers, either Astartes or amongst their Sparatoi sown men, will likely never be known. Mixed success defined the Librarius project, as its tenants were never fully incorporated into the Principia Bellicosa. Even if they had been, its creation had come at a time when the Eighteen Legions were already far diverged from the organizational strictures of that implicitly Terran tome. Ultimately, it was a stopgap measure, however well-intentioned, that only delayed the onset of a final and ultimate ruling of the Psyker question, one that had, by the time of its arrival, through pan-imperial politics, military concerns, and even demigod sibling rivalry, become inextricably bound to the actions of Magnus the Red and his Thousand Sons. In the lead-up to the Conclave, the Cyclops' initial humors were sanguine. Buoyed by the triumph of Olinor and his stated excitement for a time he felt was the dawning of a new human age, Magnus went into the Council with total confidence in his own abilities and role of honor, as well as those of his sons, and, perhaps naively, the belief that others in attendance could be swayed with logic, reason, and appeals to a greater goal for humanity. His initial enthusiasm was to be immediately doused, as the scope, and indeed venom, of his opponents were made abundantly clear. Chief Librarian of the Thousand Sons, Azek Ariman, noted in his journal the extreme disappointment of seeing Othir Weirdmake, rune priest of the Space Wolves and a presumed friend of the 15th Legion, openly denounce them as corruptive sorcerers, practicing, in the Fenrisian term, maleficarum, that would damn the Great Crusade to misery and strife. Despite the Crimson King's protestations at having been ambushed effectively, another would raise his voice in opposition to the Cyclopses, Mortarion of the Death Guard. Presented here is the Death Lord's speech, should you have clearance enough to access this particular part of the record. that his issue has vexed the Imperium, but he is wrong to believe there is anything complex about the issue. I have seen the devastation that unchecked sorcery leaves in its wake. Worlds burned to cinders, populations enslaved, and monsters unleashed. Sorcery brought these worlds to ruin. Sorcery, wielded by men, who peered too deeply into dark places they should have known to leave well alone. We all know the horror of old night, but I ask you this simple question. What brought about that galactic holocaust? Psychers. Uncontrolled psychers. The threat of these people is horribly real, and you all know the danger they represent. Some of you may even have seen it firsthand. The Psy Engines and Oculum Terra search out the latent witch genes among humanity, and the black ships of the Silent Sisterhood trawl the stars for these dangerous individuals. Did the Emperor, beloved by all, build these machines for no reason? No, they were built to protect us from these dangerous mutants using their powers in service of their selfish ends. That is the difference. Where an astrotelepath or navigator uses his powers for the good of others, allowing distant worlds to communicate, or guiding the expeditionary fleets of the Imperium across the stars, the sorcerer uses his power for personal gain, for earthly power and dominance. Yes, the Imperium needs certain empowered individuals, but only those sanctioned and rigidly controlled. 
We know where power unchecked inevitably leads. You have all heard the stories of old night, but who among you have really seen what that means? The Death Guard have seen. On Kajor, my legion encountered a warrior race of humans that have fallen to barbarism. Extensive orbital surveys detected no trace of advanced technology. Yet it took my legion nearly six months to bring Kajor to submission. Why? They were savages, armed with little more than blades and crude flintlock carbines. How could such a feral race of savages hold the Death Guard at bay for so long? They held us at bay because they had fell powers and unseen allies. Every night, Creatures of witchery hunted in the shadows and killed for the joy of killing. Blood-red hounds stalk the darkness of the forests with savage instinct, and juggernauts of thunder broke our lines with every charge. My warriors have fought Xeno species of every stripe and defeated them, but these were not creatures of flesh and blood. These were summoned into life by Kajori warlocks. These magi conjured lightning from their flesh, set fires with their thoughts, and cracked the very earth with their shouted oaths. No power comes without a price, and with every victory we won, we discovered what that truly meant. At the heart of every city we captured, my warriors found vast structures we came to know as blood veins. Each one was a charnel house of bones and death. We destroyed every one, and with each one lost, the strength of our foes waned. In the end, we ground down every ragamuffin force they sent against us. Surrender was not in their blood, and they died to a man destroyed by a ruling caste of warlocks who could not bear to relinquish their power. I still think of Kajor and shudder. Now, I do not accuse my brother of such barbarism, but no evil begins with such monstrous acts. If it did, no sane man would ever consider it. No, it begins slowly. A small step here, a small step there. By such acts is a man's heart turned black and rotten. A man may begin with noble intentions, believing that such small trespasses are minor things compared to the good he will do at the end of his course. But every act matters, from the smallest to the greatest. Tales of the Thousand Suns' victories are legion, but so too are the whispers of their sorceries. In the past, I've led my warriors into battle alongside those of Magnus, and am well aware of what his legion can do. So I can vouch for the truth of what the wolf says. It is sorcery. I have seen it with my own eyes, like the Magi of Kajor. The cult warriors of Magnus conjure lightning and fire to smite their foes, while their brethren crush their enemies with invisible force. I do not lie when I say that I knew fear that day, the fear that I have broken one army of warlocks, only to find myself with another at my side. You all know I distrust the institution of librarians within the rank of the Astartes, fearing what the Thousand Sons are trying to seed within our legions. No librarians sully the ranks of the Death Guard, and nor will they, while I draw breath. I have held my tongue until now, confident that others, wiser than I knew best. But I can keep silent no longer. When Brother Russ and Brother Logar spoke of the battles fought to subdue the Ark Reach Cluster, I find myself compelled to break my bonds of silence, though it tears my heart to name my own brother a warlock. I cannot stand by 
and watch his obsessions drive him and his legion into the abyss of damnation. Know that I speak not out of hatred, but out of the love I have for Magnus. This is all I have to say. The Death Lord's testimony brought the reactionary wing of the anti-psyker camp to the fore. It was blunt, deliberately so, hammering the assembled delegates and the watching Magnus with a stark and, to many, painful reminder of the terrors of old night and the danger of their coming resurgence should the Thousand Suns be permitted to continue their arcane studies. Despite his lip service to brotherly love, there was nary a hint of it in Mortarian's ideology. His position was clear, and there were many in the watching masses who readily agreed with it. The Crimson King had been dealt a massive blow to both his pride and status. While he was naturally completely aware of the suspicions and opposition to his legion and their practices, to have them stated so openly and so publicly and in front of his father and respected peers, for that matter, was another matter entirely. Chief Librarian Ariman's records upon the matter speak of the Cyclops' rage at feeling outmaneuvered and placed upon a pedestal, that the Council of Nikia had been a deception meant to frame him as a mad, degenerate witch. But it was not only the collar of the Lord of Prospero that was redolent, but his despair also. But the lofty ideals Magnus had hoped to lay before the Council seemed to be dashed upon the rocks of history. One chance the Primarch had to turn the grand arc of the species towards a higher cause, spent and now lost. However, Magnus, as was his character, rallied, coming to relish the chance to prove his virtue and the virtues of his ideals. One has managed, against all odds, to bear witness to a copy of the Crimson King's address, included herein. The fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and the murderers, the whoremongers and sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, shall have their part in the lake burning with fire and brimstone. Those words are from a book written thousands of years ago in the Forgotten Ages, ironically from a passage named Revelations. This is what people thought in those barbaric times. It shows what savagery we came from, and how easy it is for our species to turn upon one another. These words of fear sent thousands to their death over the millennia, and for what? To salve the fears of ignorant men who had not the wit to embrace the power of new ideas. If one of us were to walk among the people of those times, they would kill us for the technology we possess, thinking it witchcraft or unclean devilment. For example, before the writings of Aristarchus of Samos, men believed that Old Earth was flat, an unbroken plain where the ocean simply fell from the edges. Can you imagine anything more ridiculous? Now we take the sphericity of planets for granted. Much later, priestly scholars taught that Terra was the center of the cosmos and that the sun and planets revolved around it. The man who challenged this geocentric foolishness was tried for heresy and forced to recant his beliefs. Now we know our place in the galaxy. From the deepest desire often comes the deadliest hatred. False words are not only evil in themselves, but they infect the hearts of all who hear them with evil. Imagine what we will know in a thousand years and think, really think, what we are doing here. Imagine the Imperium of the future, a golden utopia of enlightenment and progress, where the scientist and the philosopher are equal partners with the warrior in crafting a bounteous future. Now imagine the people of that glorious age looking back through the mists of time to this moment. Think what they will know and what they would make of this travesty. They would weep to know how close the flame of enlightenment had come to being snuffed out. The art and science of questioning everything is the source of all knowledge, and to abandon that will 
doom us to slow decay, an imperium of darkness and ignorance, where those who dare to pursue knowledge, whatever the cost to themselves, are regarded with suspicion. That is not the imperium I believe in. That is not the imperium I wish to be part of. Knowledge is the food of the soul, and no knowledge can be thought of as wrong, so long as each seeker of truth is master of what he learns. Nothing worth knowing can be taught. It must be learned with the blood and sweat of experience, and there are no greater scholars of that ilk than the Thousand Sons. Even as we fight in the forefront of the Emperor's Crusade, we study the things others ignore, questing for knowledge in the places others fear to tread. There are no truths unknown, no secrets too hidden, and no paths too labyrinthine for us to follow, for they lead us upwards to enlightenment. Hard-won knowledge is of no value unless it is put into practice. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Willing is not enough. We must do. With that in mind, I beg your indulgence a little longer, and a tale I will thee tell. There is an ancient legend of old earth that speaks of three men of age now who lived in a deep cave in the mountains. These men lived shut off from the light of the world, and they would have lived in permanent darkness but for a small fire that burned in the circle of stones at the heart of the cave. They ate lichen that grew on the walls and drank cold water from an underground stream. They lived, but what they had was not living. Day after day, they sat around the fire, staring into the flickering embers and dancing flames, believing that its light was all the light in the world. The shadows made shapes and patterns on the walls, and this delighted them greatly. In their own way, they were happy, moving from day to day without ever wondering what lay beyond the flickering circle of light. One day, a mighty storm blew over the mountains, but so deep were the men that only the merest breath of it reached their cave. The fire danced in the wind, and the men laughed to see new patterns on the wall. The wind died, and they went back to contemplating the fire, much as they had always done. But one of the men got up and walked away from the fire, which surprised the other men greatly, and they bade him return to sit with them. This lone man shook his head, for he alone had a thirst to learn more of the wind. He followed it as it retreated from the cave, climbing steep cliffs, crossing chasms, and negotiating many perils before he finally saw a faint haze of light ahead of him. He climbed out of the cave, emerging onto the side of the mountain, and looked up at the blazing sun. Its light blinded him, and he fell to his knees, overcome by its beauty and warmth. He feared he had burnt out his eyes, but soon his vision returned and he hesitantly looked around him. He had come out of the cave high on the mountain's flank, and the world was spread out before him in all its glory, glittering green seas and endless fields of golden corn. He wept to see such things, distraught that he had wasted so many years in darkness, oblivious to the glory of the world around him, a world that had been there all along, but which his limited vision had denied him. Can you imagine what it felt like to have spent your entire life staring at a small fire and thinking it was the only light in the world, only to be then confronted by the sun? The man knew he had to tell his friends of this miraculous discovery, and he made the journey back to the cave where the other man sat, still staring into the fire and smiling vacuously at the shadows on the wall. The man who had seen the sun looked at the place he had called home and saw it for the prison it truly was. He told the others what he had seen, but they were not interested in far-fetched tales of a burning eye in the sky. All they wanted to do was live their lives as they'd always lived them. They called him mad and laughed at him, continuing to stare at the fire as it was the only reality they knew. The man could not understand his friend's reluctance to travel to the world above, but he resolved that he would not take their refusal to come with them as an end to the matter. He would show them the light, no matter what, and if they would not come to the light, he would bring it to them. So the man climbed back to the world of light and began to dig. 
He dug until he had widened the cave mouth. He dug for a hundred years, and then a hundred more, until he had dug away the top of the mountain. Then he dug downwards, a great pit into the heart of the mountain, until he broke through into the cave where his fellows sat around the fire. The men were amazed at what he showed them, the life they had been missing for all their lives, the golden joy that could be theirs were they just brave enough to take his hand and follow him. One by one, they climbed from their dark cave and saw the truth of the world around them, all its wonders and all its beauty. They looked back at the dank, lightless cave they had called home and were horrified by how limited their understanding of the world had been. They heaped praise upon the man who had shown them the way to the light and honored him greatly, for the world and all its bounty was theirs to explore forevermore. The man knew he had to show his friends the truth of the world around them, and just as it was his duty to save his friends from their dull, sightless existence, it is our duty to do the same for humanity. The Thousand Suns alone, of all the legions, have seen the light beyond the gates of the Imperium. That light will free us from the shackles of our mundane perceptions of reality and allow the human race to stand as masters of the galaxy. Just as the men around the fire needed to be shown the glorious future that lay within their grasp, so too does humanity. The knowledge the Thousand Suns are gathering will allow everyone to know what we know, to see as we see. Humanity needs to be led upwards with small steps, with their eyes gradually opened lest the light blind them. That is the ultimate goal of the Thousand Suns. Our future as a race is at stake. My friends, I urge you not to throw away this chance for enlightenment, for we are at a tipping point in the history of the Imperium. Think of the future and how this moment will be judged in the millennia to come. Thank you for your attention. That is all I have to say. The twin speeches of Mortarion and Magnus are not by any means the only testimony delivered to the Emperor of Mankind during the course of the Council. While ultimately brief, Parties from the length and breadth of the Imperium nonetheless used the Congress to make their positions clear, including a delegation of librarians from the Legiones Astartes themselves, led by the 5th Legion Whitescars' chief stormseer, Targute Yasuge. While it may seem a disservice to those who spoke, to summarize the Council in only two addresses, one is forced to concede that they embody, in their polarity, the stakes of Nikia rather well. The librarius question and the fate of the Thousand Suns were, in honesty, one and the same. Other legions could lose elements of their structural makeup, perhaps at most a tactical tool in their repertoire. The Fifteenth Legion would lose everything that made them unique amongst their brethren. While they would be able to prosecute their wars, they are still an Astartes legion after all, they would be sorely maimed. One should, however, note one crucial aspect, one likely lost upon even the most learned of delegates. The tale, as related by Magnus, was altered. Crimson King doubtlessly knew the true ending, but shifted the outcome to better reflect his desired metaphor. In the original legend, the man is torn to shreds by his terrified compatriots, whose minds break utterly at the sights he has shown them. They leave behind their friend's bloody remains, retreating even deeper into their cave and even further away from the light. As an allegory, it was originally intended to be a warning against showing those too ignorant, those whose reality was too narrowly limited by truncated perception, the great truths of life and the universe. By changing the ending, Magnus changed the message of the parable to one better suited to his needs. It still, if one is being honest, works. The metaphor is certainly hopeful, and one imagines that in those heady days of crusade ideals and manifest destiny, unblemished by the trauma of the true nature of reality, that it could have swayed the minds of those who heard it. 
However, one cannot also ignore that this speech, in a fundamental way, embodies the folly and arrogance of Magnus the Red. Eloquence, logic, reason, the loftiest of ideals. But never the full truth. A fundamental lie at the core. A cancer just waiting to be exposed. Ultimately, the judgment of Magnus and of the Astarte Psyker could and would come from only one being, no matter how many minds were swayed by the Death Lord or the Crimson King. As supreme arbitrator of the Council, the decision rested at the hand of the Emperor. Scholars have debated the ruling throughout the ages, many even decrying the Emperor for his judgment that day given the events that were ultimately to unfold because of it. Others support it entirely, given that, as the Emperor even then was surely possessed of his divinity, it was entirely the fault of others that events played out as they did. The benefit of hindsight is a quixotic thing, as anyone who is learned in such matters cannot help but bind the fall of the Crimson King, the burning of Prospero, the tragedy of the Thousand Sons, throne, the Horus Heresy itself, to the deliverance of the Emperor's writ upon that fateful day. The debate, such as there has ever been one, only serves to obscure what transpired, muddying the facts with wild conjecture and ideological positioning. Yes, that is the role of the Historator, to interpret as much as to chronicle, but when dealing with such a momentous event, there is a temptation enough to moralize without the necessity of picking a side weighing down yet further. Presented here, then, is the Emperor's own judgment, rendered as best as possible given the degraded quality of the recording. Prepare, Acolyte. The words of the Divine were about to bless you. Hear now the words of my ruling. I am not blind to the needs of the Imperium, but nor am I blind to the realities of the hearts of men. I hear men speak of knowledge and power as though they are abstract concepts to be employed as simply as a sword or gun. They are not. Power is a living force, and the danger with power is obsession. A man who attains a measure of power will find it comes to dominate his life until all he can think of is the acquisition of more. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but few can stand the ultimate test of character, that of wielding power without succumbing to its darker temptations. Peering into the darkness to gain knowledge of the warp is fraught with peril, for it is an inconstant place of shifting reality capricious lies, and untruths. The seeker after truth must have a care that he is not deceived, for false knowledge is far more dangerous than ignorance. All men wish to possess knowledge, but few are willing to pay the price. Always men will seek to take the shortcut, the quick route to power, and it is a man's own mind, not his enemy or foe, that will lure him to evil ways. True knowledge is gained only after the acquisition of wisdom. Without wisdom, a powerful person does not become more powerful. He becomes reckless. His power will turn on him and eventually destroy all he has built. I have walked paths no man can do and faced the unnameable creatures of the warp. I understand all too well the secrets and dangers that lurk in its hidden darkness. Such things are not for lesser minds to know, no matter how powerful or knowledgeable they believe themselves to be. The secrets I have shared serve as warnings, not enticements to explore further. Only death and damnation await those who pry too deeply into secrets not meant for mortals. I see now I have allowed my sons to delve too profoundly into matters I should never have permitted them to know even existed. Let it be known that no one shall suffer censure, for this conclave is to serve unity, not discord. But no more shall the threat of sorcery be allowed 
to take the warriors of the Astartes. Henceforth, it is my will that no legion will maintain a librarious department. All its warriors and instructors must be returned to the battle companies and never again employ any psychic powers. Woe betide he who ignores my warning or breaks faith with me. He shall be my enemy, and I will visit such destruction upon him and all his followers that, until the end of all things, he shall rue the day he turned from my light. Forgive me. It, uh, it always... Well, I don't quite know how to render into words the privilege it is to hear the Master of Mankind speak. <clears throat> the Emperor, beloved by all, had rendered his judgment, a ruling that would become forever known as the Edict of Nikia. The use of psychers by his Astartes legions was banned utterly. Magnus was rebuked, denied any ability to further study his arts, under pain of the most total punishment his father could wield. The seismic impact of this decision would take years to unfold, but it is safe to say that unfold it did, and in ways likely none could have ever foreseen. Was it ever intended to be such? Was the Emperor truly meaning to forsake the powers wielded by his own creations? By his own sons? For eternity? Mayhap, like the Librarius it outlawed, the Edict was intended to be ultimately temporary. To buy time for... more. Something more. Perhaps a greater work that he was pursuing, the work that I have encountered dozens of oblique, maddening references to in my studies on the heresy. Alas, we will never likely know the truth of the matter, and I am indulging in precisely the type of speculation that I forewarned against. There only remains what occurred, and the terrible, terrible events it precipitated. Until a time that I may have stomach to pen such tragedies. Ave Imperator. Gloria. In Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculusimperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.